Greetings from Richmond, Virginia. I'm very happy to be at least virtually in Piatigorsk with you this morning. I'm going to be talking about new directions in language learning through technology. And let me preface my remarks by saying that the perspective that I'm offering is that uh, from the United States and that available tools and services that I'm talking about uh, may not be universally available. But I'm going to start by talking about general trends in language learning technology today. One of those, at least that the, in the United States, among my students, that's very in, important, is the growth in informal language learning. That is to say, language learning outside of the classroom that supplements, may supplement what is happening in class, but also may be something that students are undertaking on an independent basis. This is linked to the massive growth in the internet and in online resources. Another trend is in language learning being personalized to individual learners. We all know that not all students have the same goals and the same needs in terms of language learning. And the technologies available today allow a great deal of personalization and in particular uh, to have services and tools available from desktop to mobile devices, what's sometimes called seamless learning. A third major trend is advances or advances in natural language processing and artificial intelligence as applied to language. And uh, <clears throat> one of those that's widely used today is automatic speech recognition. This is often combined with synthesized speech output. I'm going to be talking about all three of these trends in more detail and giving examples throughout my presentation. I'm going to be starting with informal language learning. And we all know that the internet has a lot of useless information out there, but there's also uh, the possibility of using the resources for language learning in many languages, but especially rich a resource for English as a second language. And there are many examples that I could give of this, um, students using the internet in this way. One of those is called fan fiction, which is an interesting, interesting phenomenon. This involves um, students who take a popular movie or comic book or TV series. An example would be Star Wars and write uh, sequels, uh, continue the story, or write new chapters in the story. This is an example of that um, online. And this obviously gives uh, students who are learning English experience with both reading and writing and connecting with real communities online. There is a lot of opportunities along those lines uh, with collaborating and participating in online communities or online gaming. Those are obviously very big uh, uh, free time activities for a lot of our students. And I would say that that's a worldwide phenomenon. <clears throat> One of the things that we're seeing in the United States is the rising popularity of online language learning services that often the students will find on their own and use in conjunction with learning a language at a university or starting to learn a, an additional foreign language. <clears throat> and in terms of informal language learning, I already mentioned the fact that there are lots of resources available online. Uh, some of those resources are not very good, but a lot of them are provided by the cultural institutions that are authentic. For example, online newspapers, um, magazines, there are lots of those from all different cultures that are available as linguistically and culturally authentic texts. There are lots of online reference materials available for students. For example, uh, dual language uh, dictionaries, grammar reference materials. The text can be made more comprehensible to language learners through glossing. And one of the developments here that's, I think, of particular interest is that there are capabilities today to have texts 
that have not been pedagogically prepared to be glossed automatically through add-on tools for web browsers. One of those uh, examples of those is called Globefish. And this is what um, happens when a student clicks on a word such as rotation um, in um, this particular tool and uh, it allows the student to uh, incorporate a dual language dictionary, in this case it's English to Korean, and uh, provide a gloss in the student's native language for that text. And this can be done with any online text. And there are other tools in addition to Globefish that can do this. This is particularly useful for content-based language learning, which is something of growing importance. It can be combined with teacher-prepared materials or something that the students can do outside of class. There are also lots of opportunities in terms of informal language learning for vo vocabulary development. One of those is incidental vocabulary development through reading. There are also tools, online tools available that uh, allow students to click on items such as we just saw in that example and to ha instead of having them glossed or in addition to having that item looked at, up and translated that the item can also be added to a personalized um, language learning, vocabulary learning list. There are also lots of uh, dedicated vocabulary training tools there are a number of online services. Most of them are free. Flashcard Exchange and Quizlet are two that my students tend to use quite a bit. One of the th trends that we're seeing in terms of vocabulary learning are new ways that uh, learning psychology has introduced for optimal learning of discrete uh, items. Um, it's been found that, for example, working every day on a list of vocabulary is not as effective as waiting uh, a certain length of time and reviewing the vocabulary items on a particular rhythm. So you might learn a list one day and not work with it the next day, but wait two days, and then after that, well, wait for one week. So there are algorithms for spaced repetition that are built into a lot of these vocabulary learning tools. One of those that I've used quite a bit is called Anki. Listening comprehension is something also that uh, is available online. So they're not just uh, uh, written text. There are lots of podcasts, streaming audio. Uh, most of these are available in mobile format. These are available in multiple languages, very often with uh, possibilities for getting uh, different uh, language levels or registers and uh, different regional accents as well, which is very valuable to students uh, to get beyond just the language uh, that's used by their instructor. Often uh, what's uh, available is not just audio, but video as well. Um, a lot of times the YouTube videos or other online videos will include uh, subtitles or even transcripts. And I might mention the fact that YouTube today allows automatic transcript generation, currently only in English, and it's not foolproof, it's not perfect, but it does provide uh, the ability to give a starting point for a video transcription. There are lots of opportunities for pronunciation, practice, and speaking that go beyond the classroom teacher's um, language uh, accent. Uh, there are tools that compare uh, speech patterns uh, that will show you, show the student the waveform or pitch contours that uh, can be very useful. This is one that's used in a tool called Tell Me More. 
um, and uh, it compares the native speaker's speech pattern to that of the student learner. There are, of course, lots of opportunities for students to get online and to find conversation partners. That's often called teletandem or tandem learners, where students will pair with a uh, student who is learning um, a, the, the native language of that particular student and um, so that there are two languages involved and uh, each uh, learner has the opportunity to practice in the L2, the, the language that's being learned. And there are lots of online services uh, and programs available. One of those uh, that's quite popular in the United States is called VoiceThread. Lots of opportunities for writing practice. I mentioned fan fiction. There are lots of possibilities for finding uh, a partner with whom one can exchange written messages uh, as well. These can be through email or through text messages. There are lots of other opportunities for students to do writing online, such as participation in online review sites or blogs um, that can be quite valuable for students. There are <coughs> increasingly, there's increasingly interest in automatic writing evaluation. Um, a lot of this is being done for English uh, and there, uh, this builds on advances in language processing. Some of these machine reading programs actually do a very good job uh, <coughs> evaluating certain aspects of reading but uh, they still have uh, a ways to go to be uh, truly uh, effective as uh, evaluators of students' writing. A second major trend that I mentioned at the beginning is um, language learning personalized to individual students. There are a wealth of resources out there for students, but um, one of the issues with that is how does a student find what resources are, uh, are particularly useful for him or for her. If the student can do that, it's possible to personalize the learning resources that can be useful to the student. So if the student is particularly interested in, in certain content, um, that, that can, can be found and, and set up for the student. Um, and there are programs that uh, particularly are geared to helping students to do that to collect resources and to put them together into a uh, user-friendly uh, web-based format. There are also self-assessment tools. Um, I know for German, for example, the Goethe Institute has online um, self-evaluation tests available that, and this, uh, these I'm sure are available for other languages, uh, particularly for English as well, that allow students to um, look at where they are, assess their own language learning in different skills. And one of the, the important um, aspects of using the internet today for language learning is the fact that there are so many resources out there that it's a very rich environment, but there's so many bad resources uh, and so many to choose from that it can lead to uh, a uh, very confused situation for students. They don't know where to start. And so the teacher's role, it seems to me, is particularly important these days in guiding students and providing students with knowledge about how to go about learning um, languages. I imagine the students at, at Piatigorsk uh, probably don't need as much guidance as my students do, who are typically learning um, German or French or whatever language they're taking at the university as their first foreign language. And so uh, what, one of the things that's important for us to, to provide here is a lot of guidance in the language learning process. Yeah, I think one of the, the things that uh, teachers these days um, can do for their students is to talk a little bit about the resources that are available online and how to use those resources in optimal ways. A lot of students, I'm sure, in Russia, as is the case in the United States, use Google Translate or other services 
to help with homework assignments. And one of the things that I like to do in class is talk about the limitations of such tools. And I give them a demonstration by showing um, a typical uh, sentence, um, in this case in German, um, as it, uh, a translation from in, into German from an, from an English sentence, <clears throat> and to demonstrate the, the problems that, um, uh, that can arise in machine translation. And the English sentence that's being translated here is, I'm going to the store today to buy my father a tie. <clears throat> and the four different machine translations None of them are very good. The uh, translation by uh, Google um, uh, has a lot of grammatical errors. Ich bin in den Laden gehen. Uh, it's not the past participle uh, that's used. Uh, the word order is wrong. Heute zu kaufen. Um, mein Vater is in the wrong case. Um, it should be in the dative case. The word order there in terms of objects is also incorrect. And if you look at, if you know German and look at the other examples, they're even worse uh, than that. Um, and so they're very far removed from being uh, accurate, uh, grammatically correct, or even understandable translations of the English sentence. And so I think it's important to point out to students the limitations uh, of using a tool such as Google Translate and, and, and look at concrete examples such as this. One of the other things that I try to do for my students is to encourage the use of self-assessment tools available online and to have the students think about documenting their language learning by creating an uh, online portfolio of which there are many types available today. I'm going to talk about a, another trend that's very important, um, mobile, mobile technologies and language learning. A lot of people say that this changes things dramatically in terms of the field of language learning. And it's certainly true that with the apps, the mobile apps that are available for smartphones and tablets today, there are lots of options there for personalizing um, the tools and services that, that might be used uh, for language learning. And there are lots of programs that work across platforms that will seamlessly allow students to go from a desktop or a laptop to a mobile device or to use exclusively a mobile device uh, for their language learning practice. And um, there are ways of, uh, of syncing devices uh, across platforms. And for example, I talked about vocabulary learning and a lot of these tools and services will allow students to go from an online desktop browser-based environment to an app, a specialized app that's been developed for a um, mobile phone, an Android or Apple phone, and everything will be synced up um, through a client-server <coughs> relationship. The <coughs> in-class use of mobile devices is just being explored, and I think most language teachers probably see mobile devices in the classroom as a distraction and not as a positive factor. But in fact, it seems to me that one of the things that we ought to do is think about um, the fact that students are bringing a device, a mobile device, to class. And uh, to use that BYOD uh, environment, bringing your own device, um, to see if uh, in fact, useful things can be done with uh, mobile technology in the classroom. And one of the advantages of having students um, use their own smartphone or tablet in a language learning or in any kind of academic environment is the fact that this, these are devices that are always with the students and they connect with the students' real lives outside of the classroom, outside of the university. And that makes it more likely that the students will use those tools and services outside of class. In class, one of the things that can be done is that information can be looked up on the fly in class. So 
uh, if a question comes up, uh, the instructor can assign one of the students to look up uh, that information on his or her mobile device. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing with my students in uh, intermediate language classes is to replace uh, what are uh, often used in American universities, namely clickers, with uh, mobile devices. Clickers are um, <clears throat> physical devices, uh, dedicated uh, small electronic um, messenger service uh, devices that send a message to a central uh, server, uh, but they're very limited in their capabilities. They can only do multiple choice or um, true or false questions. And one of the things that I've used um, is um, Google Forms to create questions that go beyond just multiple choice that include fill in the blank questions, very useful obviously for language learning, and have the students with their mobile devices call up this Google Form that has questions on it. I often use this for re review before exams and have the students fill in the questions and submit those and then I will display on the um, monitor that is in the classroom the student responses and discuss those and, and talk about the wrong uh, answers and correct those. The third trend that I mentioned before is language learning, uh, natural language processing and um, its application to language learning. There's been interest in artificial intelligence, of course, for a long time, and it used to be very limited in terms of what could be applied to language learning. Uh, most of what was used in early uh, machine evaluations of student uh, input was pattern matching, which is very limited. Today, natural language processing is used um, very widely in commercial language software uh, particular automatic speech recognition. This is very familiar to consumers in general from uh, a lot of commercial services that are available. In terms of language learning, um, the automatic speech recognition has improved dramatically in recent years. This is an example from Rosetta Stone where uh, users are asked questions in Chinese and asked to give responses in oral, in oral format, and spoken responses that are then evaluated and uh, marked as correct or incorrect by the software. And these have become quite sophisticated and quite accurate uh, in recent years. This natural language processing is widely implemented today in mobile devices in uh, products such as Siri uh, for Apple phones or Google Now for Android devices. And um, one of the things that's happening now is a great interest by companies like Google in collecting large amounts of data um, and using uh, advanced technologies to analyze that data and to improve on uh, speech recognition. And so this certainly is, is something that will continue and will continue to evolve uh, in terms of more greater accuracy. Natural language processing uh, is used uh, extensively in grammar drills. This obviously can be very useful to students. And uh, today, the intelligent tutors go beyond the pattern matching used uh, in early software to actually um, use artificial intelligence to uh, analyze uh, student input and provide individual feedback. So they're quite sophisticated. And one of the things that uh, can happen with these intelligent tutors is that they build a profile of individual learners and can so uh, remember the history of that learner, provide uh, extra practice when that's needed, or depending on the interests of the students, uh, branch out into particular areas. And this is something that's being um, done also with mobile devices. Uh, increasingly, there's interest in that direction in language learning. 
I'm going to um, end my presentation by talking briefly about what I see as likely directions in language learning and technology today. Um, one of those that I just mentioned, uh, intelligent tutors. I think we're going to be seeing more and more of those becoming much more sophisticated and more effective, particularly as more data is collected um, by companies such as Google, other companies as well. I think we're going to see increasing interest in syncing uh, between mobile devices and the desktop, laptop computer, computers. Uh, one of the uh, areas of interest here is uh, building online student profiles or portfolios in which, uh, which include um, recording all the information that the student uh, generates through use of online tools and, and services. And um, I think what will be part of that also will be more ways to document informal learning and combining documenting informal learning with standardized test results. Um, and this could include a lot of different areas in which students are active today. And so I think my time is up, so I will um, stop at this point and thank you very much for your attention. And if you would like to contact me, here is my email address, rgjones at vcu.edu. And I hope that you have a very successful conference in Piatigorsk. Goodbye.